What is going on, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back to talk about episode nine of The Outsider, an episode called Tigers and Bears, obviously an abbreviation of the famous line from The Wizard of Oz. But with the incredible cliffhanger ending of this episode, our characters are facing considerably worse than lions and tigers and bears. I'd argue that this cliffhanger of this episode was by far the strongest closing scene of any episode that we've seen all season. And that may or may not have something to do with the fact that best-selling author Dennis Lehane was the writer of this particular episode. If you have not seen episode nine yet, bail out now because I will be diving into spoilers. But what I loved is how this episode drew to a close with so many moving pieces. We've got Jack blowing people's brains out with a sniper rifle. We've got a snake creeping up behind him. We got El Cuco in the cave just waiting for everybody. And of course, you got a little cavalry and backup on the way, which may or may not arrive too late to save everybody. But if you saw the teaser for the next episode, you know at a minimum that Ralph and Holly get inside the cave for their epic showdown with El Cuco, a.k.a. The Outsider. Now, before I get to my official review, as always, I'd like to share a little news related to the show. However, there wasn't really anything to talk about related to The Outsider. However, I should give y'all a heads up that this time slot in two weeks' time will be taken over by Westworld Season 3. If you're not caught up with Westworld, I strongly recommend you do so. While I would argue that Season 1 was dramatically stronger than Season 2, because Season 3 takes place in a dramatically different status quo, I've got my finger Fingers crossed the season three is really going to deliver. But with the season finale of The Outsider next week, I'm sure a lot of people are worried about a Stephen King-sized hole being left in their lives. So what I'm going to do at the end of this video, I'm going to make a few recommendations of Stephen King adaptations in film and television that will help you scratch your itch after this show draws to a close. Also, as long as I'm making recommendations, if you really enjoyed this season of The Outsider, in particular the first two episodes, which were directed by Jason Bateman, Yesterday, I started watching the show Ozark, where he also directed a lot of episodes, and I'm absolutely loving it so far, and I fully intend on covering it when season three gets released later this month. And while Ozark is a very different show from The Outsider, you will notice some similar ingredients between the two shows, in particular, actor Mark Menchaca, who plays Jack in Outsider, who's absolutely incredible in Ozark as well. In any event, this is a review of The Outsider, not Ozark, so let's dive into episode nine. So I think this was a very strong episode overall, and obviously anytime an episode ends in such emphatic fashion, it's going to leave you with a very positive impression. However, my one knock against the episode is that so much of the episode's running time was spent in this giant flashback that wasn't directly tied into El Cuco. Obviously, it raises the stakes for the season finale in that no guns can be fired inside this system of caves unless you want to risk being trapped inside. But when you're getting close to the end of a show, I feel like that's the time to spend a lot of time with your central characters before the audience inevitably has to say goodbye. And I feel like this episode could have delivered all that information about the kids getting lost in the cave and the subsequent search for them back in the 1940s. I just think it all could have been delivered in a much more economic fashion. That said, it was a pretty gripping, intense scene, especially when everybody's yelling and screaming in panic, causing the cave-in behind them. And if anybody out there has any claustrophobia whatsoever, I'm sure they're having an absolute panic attack watching that scene. But the main drama of this episode is all about trying to figure out where is El Cuco hiding and how can they corner him without cluing him into the fact that they're hot on his trail. Because Holly has the theory that anything that Claude sees or here is going to be directly fed to El Cuco. And they're not even entirely sure what El Cuco might be vulnerable to, if he can be killed at all. But they figure since he eats and he lives and he breathes, obviously there's got to be some way to take him down. So while they plot and scheme and try to figure out where they might be going, I love how Howard takes Claude on this lengthy road trip to go pick up some fried chicken. And I don't know about you guys, but when I was watching that scene, I just started salivating and having this intense lust for fried chicken, especially later on in the episode, once Howard was totally baked and went and raided the kitchen for leftovers. So while the central characters are desperately trying to figure out where well, Okuka might be hiding, we get a few scenes back where the story all started, where Glory comes to see Janie, and she talks about how the DA has been asking to speak with her, because as we see, the DA has been confronted with some new evidence that there's been a similar killing to the Peterson kid, and he's starting to realize that he really screwed up pursuing Terry Maitland so aggressively. So the rest of the episode is all about just trying to figure out where El Cuco might be. We get some scenes with Holly and Andy exploring a graveyard, and he's saying sweet things to her, making her smile. Every time Andy says something nice to Holly, I always predict that something horrible is going to happen to Andy. However, this show has taken so many liberties with the source material. At this point, they're basically telling their own story, so who the hell knows what's going to happen between the two of them in the season finale. But we get another scene where Ralph and Eunice are talking to the little kid that got nearly abducted and eaten, and they're asking if he got scratched. Neither the child nor the grandfather got scratched. But the kid's references to the bear cave lead them nowhere because on the official tour guide, there is no bear cave, but apparently there's a cave nearby that has all these bear scratches on the walls. 
In any event, Claude's surly, kind of stubborn, kind of bad attitude brother finally clues him in on why the bear cave's nearer on the maps because back in the 1940s, it was sealed up when four of his ancestors, as well as dozens of other people, died in the cave-in looking for those two lost boys. However, in recent years, the secret entrance behind the souvenir shop, while it was covered in cement for years, a lot of folks have broken in there recently in order to smoke weed or do whatever. But another scene that I really enjoyed is when they're all en route to the bear cave and Alec and Eunice and Ralph are having a conversation about the supernatural and Ralph's basically having a freak out realizing just how many other things might be called into question now that they're dealing with something that's officially part of the supernatural. And I love Alec's advice. He just says, you know what? Take small bites. Eunice is a little more practical, still wondering what's going to happen if push comes to shove because they have no idea what this thing might be vulnerable to. But the whole situation turns ass over teacup when Claude's brother, trying to look after his brother, tells him about what's going on, not realizing that he's basically just sent an email to El Cuco letting him know what's up. Howard calls him a dumb fuck, but they end up arming themselves with baseball bats and shotguns and all kinds of stuff, packing in the car, and the three of them take off, trying to either warn or help the rest of the characters before something terrible happens. And then, as I mentioned before, the episode draws to the close with this incredible cliffhanger. We have Jack up on a ridge with his sniper rifle and a pitchfork for some reason. He doesn't see the snake nearby that's creeping up behind him. And inside the cars, we see Holly and Andy having another sweet moment where they're talking about old movies. And I did appreciate the fact that that ingredient from her character from the book did finally make it into the show. Because in the book, Holly Gibney is a massive movie freak. But as soon as they kissed, I was expecting a bullet just to come through and take off the top of Andy's head. But he survived at least to the end of this episode. And when they get out of the car, she reminds Andy that shooting a gun in that cave will be a really bad idea, but he just likes having that security. And then the last few seconds of the episode were absolutely incredible. We see Alec going down, bullet to the head, blood is splattering on Ralph's face, and then we get the sound of multiple gunshots as the show fades to black, and the gunshots just kept ringing and ringing. It was an incredible cliffhanger. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if viewership spikes leading into the season finale next week. So all in all, I'm very satisfied with the direction of the season. I'm really glad that I stuck with it. I feel like the season had its ups and downs. I know for a fact from some people reaching out to me on Twitter that there are a lot of people who hold this show in much higher regard than I do. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. I just don't think it's a complete total home run. But if you're looking for some Stephen King ad adaptations that are a complete home run, let me give you my five favorite movie adaptations of Stephen King's stories. And I'm not going to say them in descending order or maybe, well, I'm just going to rattle them off at the top of my head. So in no particular order, I would say David Cronenberg's adaptation of The Dead Zone from the early 80s. That's when David Cronenberg was absolutely in his prime. And I feel like that novel also comes from Stephen King's richest, greatest period. And it's one of Christopher Walken's finest performances. I would also recommend Brian De Palma's adaptation of Carrie. Brian De Palma's career skyrocketed after that film, but it's one of the most intense, visceral, humorous, erotic, just wild movies of that entire decade. And I feel like you could watch it a hundred times over and it would be just as deliriously entertaining each time out. And this next one might seem a little obvious, but it's obvious for a reason. Stanley Kubrick's adaptation of The Shining. Very rarely do we see one of the greatest filmmakers of all time tackling horror in such a complete and total unrestrained, unbridled, just delirious way, especially with an actor who's as game as Jack Nicholson. But not only is it one of the greatest horror movies ever made, I would argue that it's one of the greatest movies ever made. And when you look at the trajectory of Stanley Kubrick's career from doing film noir and historical epics and then controversial films like Lolita or tackling nuclear Armageddon, a humorous fashion with Dr. Strangelove or sci-fi with 2001 or yet another giant historical epic with Barry Lyndon. The fact that his career would slowly but surely lead to The Shining, just an incredible career path. And that was the first time, I believe, yeah, that was the first time I ever saw a movie, any movie by Stanley Kubrick. So that was my gateway. So definitely check out The Shining. But my last two recommendations, they aren't even in the horror genre, but I think Rob Reiner's adaptation of The Body, which became Stand By Me, is one of the best movies of the 80s. And it's one of the last movies about kids and teens that actually portrays kids the way they really are. I feel like Hollywood does a really horrible job, more often than not, of portraying the way kids behave, the way they speak. And Stand By Me just leans into it. And it's just, it's one of the key films that I saw from my childhood, and I've seen it countless times. And the last one, I'm going to go with Shawshank Redemption because I think it's one of the best films of the 1990s. For whatever reason, it didn't make a huge splash upon its initial release, but for a long time, it was the highest rated movie on IMDb. Obviously, its reputation has grown over the years, but Frank Darabont's film, it's an absolute masterpiece, and it will move even the coldest the coldest, deadest heart to tears at one point or another. So if you're starting to worry about the outside or leaving your life, those five movies will definitely help you get back into the world of Stephen King in very exciting fashion. 
And there are so many other movies and shows that are worth recommending as well, but I figured for the sake of brevity, I should keep my recommendation down to five, but maybe at some point I'll do a giant video about all my favorite Stephen King adaptations in film and television, but those five will definitely be enough to get you started. But I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap this video up, so if you enjoyed this review, please consider subscribing to my channel and hitting that notification bell. It's very helpful to me, but feel free to leave a comment in the comments below or hunt me down on Twitter at Colbrex, but I hope everyone has an amazing week, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.